Welcome to this presentation on empowering civil society in contemporary global challenges for democracy and human rights, perspectives from the Conference of International Non-Governmental Organisations in the Council of Europe. I'm Ruth Allen, and in addition to being the Chief Executive of the British Association of Social Workers, I'm here in my capacity as the International Federation of Social Workers representative and elected member of the Standing Committee of the Conference of International Non-Governmental Organisations, known as SINGO, and that is within the Council of Europe. I will briefly introduce these organisations and their relevance to the People's Eco Summit aims. But first, I will introduce the main speakers for this session. So firstly, Gerhard Ermischer, the current president of SINGO. Hi, Gerhard. Hello. And Anna Roker, immediate past president of SINGO, also the chair of the Committee Action for Social Rights within SINGO and a senior lecturer at Paris Nanterre University and a social worker. Hello, Anna. He Hello, Ruth. Hello, Gerhard. Nice to see you. Hi. So in my International Federation of Social Workers representative role in SINGO, I aim to promote the importance of social work perspectives in the heart of SINGO and in Council of Europe. Council of Europe is the European body that leads the region on the promotion of democracy, rule of law and human rights, and indeed has influence across the wider world. It's the home of the European Court of Human Rights, which functions to implement and promote the European Convention on Human Rights. And SINGO, within the Council of Europe, is proud to be a partner to this Eco-Social People's Summit. This session will explore how and why the Council of Europe and SINGO are aligned with the summit's aims to create a more just and democratic world through empowerment of all communities, tackling the huge challenges of today, including revitalizing democracy, promoting global peacemaking, overcoming the pandemic and tackling climate change and promoting human rights and social rights. To say briefly, modern global social work and the International Federation of Social Workers as we know it, grew out of the same democratizing and peacemaking imperatives after the Second World War that also led to the creation of the Council of Europe in 1949. And so it's important, I believe, that we understand within social work the importance of the Council of Europe and its role in promoting democratic values and fundamental human rights and freedoms across the whole of wider Europe, 46 nations in all. The Council of Europe is not a lawmaking body, but works to uphold and foster national and international law that are aligned with its democratic ideals. And SINGO within it is the voice of civil society. It sits alongside, challenges, influences, and collaborates with the political structures, the Parliamentary Assembly and the Council of Ministers from all member states. To say more on all of this about uh, what SINGO is all about and about the Council of Europe, it's now my pleasure to go over to Gerhard Ermischer. Gerhard. Thank you very much, Ruth. Yeah, well, um, first of all, what is the Conference of INGOs in, in, in the Council of Europe? And the Conference of INGOs is the body of all those international non-governmental organizations which hold a participatory status with the Council of Europe, which is quite a unique status, is all the intergovernmental international organizations we have, like the UN or the OECD. Um, it is really giving us quite a powerful stand inside the Council of Europe, where we can actually participate in all the processes of producing, drafting new um, pieces of international law, of uh, recommendations, guidelines, which come from the Council of Europe, uh, which then are adopted by the Committee of Ministers and become legally binding or non-binding instruments for the member countries, which still are 46 countries in Europe. Now, this gives us on one hand a powerful stand inside the Council of Europe, on the other hand, um, we still are a little bit a, a, a colorful dog inside the house because we are also self um, regulated and we have uh, the right to give us our own statutes so we are more independent than most of the other bodies of the council of europe um, which means that we can act a little bit more um, decisive a little more sometimes also aggressive uh, which is the role of of civil society of course and of ngos to be the watchdogs and sometimes to be the pain in the ass 
but it also means that we have the same kind of, uh, of means and infrastructure than other bodies like the Parliamentary Assembly or the Congress of the Reach. So we depend a lot of volunteer work, which should be sound very, very um, um, well known to you coming from the field of social uh, social work uh, and, and, so, uh, and, and working with volunteers, I guess, every day out in the field there. The question for us is, Ruth said, why is the Council of Europe important for you? The other question, of course, also is, how important are social rights and social aspects for the Council of Europe? And basically to say that they are extremely important, but as with so many other things in the Council of Europe, it also depends on us as the civil society to push the Council of Europe, of, which is an organization which is more than 70 years old, uh, into, into the direction we want it to go and to remind it from time to time that wonderful things which they have created decades ago still are valuable today, but need to be rebrushed, refurbished, um, reformed and, and brought to a new life uh, from time to time. And one of these wonderful instruments is the social charter. Social charter is really one of the greatest instruments the Council of Europe has developed, and it comes right after the uh, European Convention on Human Rights. In many ways, it's, let us say, it's the second side of the same coin. What is inscribed in the European Convention of Human Rights uh, as basic and fundamental human rights is described in the social charter uh, as the basic uh, social rights. And social rights are absolutely interlinked with human rights. It is something which the Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg more and more acknowledges, uh, basing also uh, judgments on social issues on the European uh, Convention of Human Rights. But the social charter in itself also has mechanisms which allow not just member states, but even civil society, NGOs, and individuals to use that social social charter to foster their own rights and to call their governments to account if they do not live up to the expectations and especially to um, the commitments they have undertaken. And in this very moment, in this time we live in, um, this specific part has become more important than ever for two reasons. One reason is that as many other institutions, the Council of Europe might have become a little bit slack in the last decades. After 1989-1990, so many people in Europe and outside Europe believed that with the fall of the Iron Curtain, there was a turn in history which led to a natural course to an everlasting prosperity, to more social justice, to more democracy, to more human rights to a better rule of law. Um, we thought this was going to happen naturally and we didn't really need to do a lot about it. The Council of Europe acquired practically all the countries in Europe to become members of this institution. And again, we thought that just by becoming members of the Council of Europe, just becoming members partly also of the European Union, just because economy was getting better, um, democracy would also flourish and would immediately and automatically become stronger. We had to experience that this is not the case. And Russia has, of course, reminded that in the most brutal and rude way on the 24th of February, that this is not the case. We also see the results of what happens if a country diverts more and more from the basic rules of a democratic state um, and goes into an autocratic um, direction. And, and it has also revigorated the Council of Europe. It really took very immediate actions by expulsing uh, uh, Russia from the Council of Europe according to its own statutes in a very dignified way. Uh, and it's now in the process of reinventing itself. And we as civil society, we are there, there to demand that the Council of Europe should reinvent itself and should, that it should rebuild a far more resilient democracy in Europe. And for that, we have to take serious the instruments we have. The instruments like the European Charter of Social Rights, because this is really important. It is important because 
we see that in all our societies, not just in a few countries, in all our societies, we have big parts of the population who drift away from democracy, who no longer believe that democratic structures serve their needs and demands in the way they expect it. They drift to populism, they drift to conspiracy theories. Uh, we have seen elections in in France, where 52% of the people in the presidential elections voted for populist candidates, who were all three of them in the pocket of Putin. Um, why is that? Because we have immediate, we have an immense social gaps in our societies. And in the last generation, these gaps have become wider. They have not become smaller, they have not closed, they have become wider. And that means parts of our societies just don't feel that they anymore belong to these societies and that democracy is the best cause for their actions. And this is for the social issues. This is what has to be dealt with in social politics. This is why we have to take the social charter serious and all the other instruments the Council of Europe provides for social justice, but also for, uh, for ecology, uh, for um, nature protection, for climate change, uh, and for all the issues of democracy. And to do that, we must understand that we cannot just accept that countries do not fulfill their obligations, that they get told that they do things not correctly, and then there are no consequences. We need to get back to something which is consequential, which is clear, which is structured, uh, and which is based on the values to which all the countries who are members of the Council of Europe have signed up freely, individually, by their sovereign decisions of their governments as well as their parliaments. So this is not just an, an act somebody did out of a whim, but it was really a sovereign act of these states in which they committed themselves to uphold these values. And it's up for us the civil society to hold the states to account, to tell our governments that they have to do that, to talk to our parliament parliamentarians that they have to, uh, to help us and that they have to uphold their own values and to talk to those who have taken responsibility in the Council of Europe, be it as representatives of their governments, be it as representatives in the parliamentary assembly, be it as rep uh, local and regional uh, uh, politicians and administrators who are represented in the Congress of the Regions, and of course also about our big uh, NGOs and also the national NGOs, the regional ones, even the grassroots organizations who very often are members of our international organizations, but also with whom we try to cooperate much, much more than we did in the past. We have changed our own statutes. We have made it possible to cooperate directly with national, regional, and even grassroots organizations as the conference of our NGOs. We want to be grounded. We want to be rooted. We want to hear from the everyday experience in the field of the people who are out there working as volunteers as well as professionals and who know what's going on, who experience the problems we have in the social field every day uh, to bring it back to us and to bring it back to the Council of Europe, to the decision makers in the Council of Europe, and of course, to the governments of the member states, which we can do through the ambassadors, through the committee of ministers um, and through the structures of the Council of Europe. In that, we, we depend on you, the social NGOs in that case, um, to cooperate with us, but we also offer you that cooperation. We, we are really happy to receive you. If you're an international NGO who is not already part of the uh, uh, Council of Europe and hasn't applied for the participatory status, please do so. And I'm happy to coach you and help you to do so, so that you do it successfully. And if you have already the status, then please be active and work with us. If you're not an international NGO, if you're representing a national original one while you are listening to this, nevertheless, come to us, contact us, come with your problems, come with your difficulties. Tell us what you have in your own experience, in your own environment on a regional or national level, and what we could do maybe on a European level to support you and to help you. This is the task which we have to fulfill. Um, and we are called to, to, do, to this task now in these very, very challenging days. Because as you all know, with the, with the war going on in Ukraine, um, there is also a window of opportunity which has opened for democratic societies, and democratic countries in Europe, uh, and for democratic institutions to re revitalize, to reinvent ourselves, and to become more vigorous and more active again. But I see 
see it also as a moral obligation, because in this very moment, people are dying and are suffering in Ukraine to defend us, to defend our values, to defend Europe and our democracies. And if we do not act on that, not just by helping them in all the ways we can do as NGOs, which mainly means serving the refugees, uh, bringing hum humanitarian aid to the Ukraine, it also means that we really have to take our own obligation serious and work on this more resilient democracy. And I just listened to politicians in Germany after the last elections uh, and the very low turnouts we had in the regional elections. And they say, yes, but people who are suffering from unemployment, who have social problems, they have different issues. They are not going to vote because they have to deal with their daily life uh, and with their daily problems. And they are not really interested because they do not believe that in these elections, anything can be achieved for them. Now, we are not the politicians, we are not the government, we are not the parliamentarians, we are NGOs. But even as NGOs, it's also our duty to help people to come back to a status where they can feel empowered. And we know, of course, as an individual, it's so difficult in a complicated society we live in, and one which is so much economy and money driven. But as NGOs, we also provide a network which helps to empower people. Uh, and that is, Basically, I think something which the social NGOs, more than most of the others, can do and have to do. Help us empower people, bring them back to the fold of democracy, make them feel that they can change something uh, and that these democracies serve their needs. Because we are also there to, pro, uh, to, 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 to call the politicians um, to their responsibility. Uh, and demand that they live up to the, as I said, the, 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 the obligations they have taken on by individually, on their own free will, through a democratic process, joining these institutions like the Council of Europe and joining those conventions, charters and documents which are so precious and vulnerable. Thank you. Thank you, Gerhard. Thank you very much. I'm going to hand over now straight to, to Anna. Uh, thank you, Ruth, and uh, thank you, Gerhard. It is really very complete picture what the conference is and would like to be, and uh, and how how uh, this uh, this uh, organ of the Council of Europe can bring the collective forces of civil society. Um, I, I, I would like to speak as a social worker because at the beginning I am social pedagogue uh, as well and, and social work is really very close to my heart also in my research now. Uh, and just to say, uh, maybe uh, it is the controversial point of view, but uh, uh, I, I wanted to say that um, the social workers know known what happen with democracy because if, uh, when I look on the context of Poland or uh, or other countries where um, where you see the poor people the people who yeah who who can uh, uh, who have five euros by day to spend uh, uh, and very small budget uh, it was the reality that the elites or the people who are not in this context didn't see. And uh, when the populist uh, came with the very, um, how do you say, um, strong social oriented program, uh, it was really clear social workers know as a sociologist as well, uh, that it is a danger for democracy because these people will vote for them because uh, it was the first needs and very short term view um, about about democracy, and it is still. I find I'm, I'm now I'm speaking to you from Poland, uh, and it is still there. It means that uh, uh, the question of 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 the material and and the, uh, social condition um, are so important for a lot of people which are in the needs. Uh, that's why uh, there is a clear link between social rights and democracy, uh, because it's only implementation of social rights uh, uh, and economical rights, of course, 
uh, can also guarantee the, some kind of stability. And we, we see uh, in other countries like New Zealand, for example, which implement the well being agenda of the people, uh, how uh, this can also stabilize the political regime and political, uh, and political climate. Um, because it's really uh, crazy that today in we, we, we are still in the um, gaps or some kind of uh, logic which divide the people between political rights and social rights. Why I need to choose if I want to have a social benefit and to not have the, the freedom of justice or the free courts. Uh, why I, as a citizen, I cannot have both. It should be because all of these elements uh, complicate my political, social, cultural, uh, institutional landscape. So, um, so this is crazy. Uh, I think that 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 Europe, in this sense, uh, put a lot of steps uh, um, back. Back. There is a regression. Yeah, uh, clearly. Uh, so we as a civil society, uh, uh, we need, as Gerhard said, push uh, for that and be the voice of the people uh, who don't have also the space or possibilities to be in the spaces where decisions are taken. Um, uh, and this also, this is also important to, to see that um, I, I think that mostly the people who will look on this session and also on the summit as the community workers and social workers, uh, that this kind of institution and this kind of instrument are really have a concrete impact of the people lives. Uh, it is not something abstract, you know, it's, it is not an abstraction, it is a concrete uh, instrument. And I would like to just give you uh, the example of the collective complaint um, procedures that Gerhard mentioned. So maybe I can give you a one example how it works. Uh, clearly that this is a civil society organization, uh, mostly uh, in GOS. And I have a statistic just here from the uh, Social Charter Secretariat uh, that uh, uh, collective complaints, so, um, based on the protocol voted in 1995. So from um, 1998, there was 200 free collective complaint procedures and 62% was introduced by international NGOs. Of, to, of course, after then also possible way to introduce uh, the collective complaint is to go through the national trade unions. Um, uh, it was 30% uh, and also national employers organization and international trade unions. Uh, but what is also important is that uh, this is the instrument where you can address the, the rights of the groups of people, so the, the, co the, the rights of the target group that you see as a social worker uh, undermined, um, uh, what you cannot achieve through, uh, through the European Court of Human Rights, because through the collective complaint, this is a, a, a rights which... Uh, the no implementation of the rights um, in the member states, but the rights of the groups of the people. So this is a collective uh, dimension of the instrument. Um, and it, it is also important to say that, um, of course, this is the, the, the legal or judicial uh, uh, or quasi-judicial procedures uh, as a monitoring, but it is also political. So the Committee of Ministers at the end, after the European uh, Committee of uh, Social Rights, which give the decision uh, after the Committee of Ministers, so it's the governing body of the Council of Europe, give a decision about um, um, and opinion and a decision about uh, respect or no respect of this um, rights included in the social charter by the member states. And there is after then the process of improvement. We see, and uh, I think that Ruth also, we, we can share the, the links to the database when you can find the, the example of the collective complaint. 
uh, about the Roma people, about the people with disabilities, about, uh, of course, the, the question of the working condition, which is also an important issue for, uh, for, uh, for social workers. Um, and, uh, and of course, the child protection and others, um, and others, uh, other thing. So, uh, uh, it is important to say that in the Council of Europe, there is a lot of convention, there is a lot of monitoring procedures, which are um, at the disposal of civil society. And regarding the women rights, if, uh, the civil society can, can contribute clearly to the monitoring procedures, sharing the knowledge, but also the, the funding about what happened uh, on the ground. Um, and just to, 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 to finish, I think that um, also uh, uh, important things is to connect the global north and global south. It means that very often uh, uh, we, um, um, how we say, the decision in the global well, not impact the global south, but in my perspective, uh, regarding the role of civil society in democracy, human rights, and rule of law, we have a lot of learn from the global south. Uh, as a social worker, uh, this uh, question of the role of communities uh, in the in the social support and also in the good governance as well. It is so important. Um, and as well, this uh, community organized methodology as well. So um, I think that the, 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 even if we spoke about the Council of Europe for the seven member states, but we should not forget uh, this, um, this dimension with the connection with global, global salt and, and, and also support and as well learn from the global south, what can be uh, the solution uh, for uh, for the democracy um, and and human rights as well? Because when we see the same question in different contexts, it can give us the new knowledge and the new uh, solution as well for us in Europe. So uh, so we should be connected uh, as well. I think that I, uh, I used all my time, so uh, I'm open for the question. And also, Fam, thank you for giving me the opportunities to, to be part in this conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anna. Thank you so much, Gerhard. We are virtually out of time and um, I'm just going to make a few comments to pull things together if I can. It's difficult. There's such a rich amount in those presentations and it is complex. And I think one of the challenges for Singo and one of our jobs, our roles is to make these complicated structures feel really relevant and, and accessible, for instance, through the group complaints, as Anna was describing, and as Gerhardt was encouraging people to get involved, get become part of Singo if you're in an eligible organisation, or be in touch and recognise these networks of non-governmental organisations exist right up to this very high political level to represent social and human rights and the needs um, of our communities. Um, I really like the final point you made, Anna, about the, what we can learn from the Global South and what we can do together globally, because although Singo and Council of Europe are regional, we're part of the global, this global endeavour, we can have global influence and also global learning. And to finally to say the points that have been made by both of our speakers about how vital it is that democracy is thoroughly relevant to the real social issues that people are facing, the real deprivations that people are experiencing and really tackling inequality. And that is a, a way for all peoples to be involved through more participatory approaches to democracy and for democracy not to be used as something uh, that can withstand living with inequalities. It should be all about tackling uh, inequalities and bringing greater freedoms and justice. So thank you so much to Gerhardt, thank you, Anna, and thank you for our audience for watching and listening to us. Goodbye. Thank you, goodbye. Thank you.